I, I've turned to this text then this evening. We're going to focus in verse uh, 9 to 12 there in 1 Thessalonians 4 that Nigel's read to you so helpfully there. Thank you for that. Um, we are going to think about this subject of loving, uh, loving the brethren. Uh, we desire this evening, as we read there in verse 1, to live a life that is well-pleasing to the Lord. And uh, we are trying to do that. Uh, we are doing all that we can to live lives that are pleasing to the Lord. And this evening, we're trying to express as best as we possibly can our love for one another. Um, it's been a challenge, though, hasn't it? I'm sure you've felt that. I know everything's been a challenge, but it's been a challenge, this particular thing of expressing and showing our love for one another. Um, in these last 12 months, we've all uh, retreated to our homes and how challenging it has been to express our love, the love that we do genuinely feel for our brothers and sisters in Christ. And it's also been difficult for us to experience the love of others in return uh, in the uh, in the fellowship of the church. Well, I hope this evening, as we turn to these these verses that uh, we will gain some encouragement and fresh, a fresh desire, at least, uh, for us to show our, to show love more and more, as the Apostle Paul is urging the believers here to do. And I trust that our prayers will be directed in that way as well. It's a, it's a concern for him, for the Apostle. Two central subjects, uh, or two, two subjects anyway, that the Apostle Paul is concerned about here in this section is holiness, sanctification, uh, a general life that is pleasing to God in every respect, and love, secondly, holiness and love. Um, these are two aspects that should characterise our lives, uh, moral purity and love. Uh, these characteristics are not set against each other as perhaps we might be tempted to do so from time to time. You have on the one hand, don't you, perhaps uh, characteristically the, the stern moralist who is loveless, and then on the other hand you've got the fluffy lover who uh, isn't interested in morality at all. Their morality is all over the place. You perhaps might think of different people um, if you allowed yourself to, to, to fit into one of those character, one of those uh, extremes or the other. But the Bible doesn't show any such contrast at all. Um, it, for example, in 1 John, uh, the entire epistle we know, don't we, is of keeping the commandments and loving the brethren. That's basically the whole book, isn't it? Oh, the whole letter. Uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 9 to 13 is the title of this prayer, really. Um, an exhortation then to, uh, to moral purity. And then, well, we see that then in chapter, in, in the beginning verses of chapter 4, this an urge to moral purity. And now we're moving then from verse 9 onwards in chapter 4, uh, to the subject of love. Both are essential. Uh, we can't claim one without the other, I'm saying to you. We can, we're to seek to bring them together. We can't say as a church, well, you know, we're a church that love people here and use that as an excuse as to our failure to uphold moral standards. We love and accept everybody, for example. We Churches say that, don't they? On the other hand, we can't use our high moral principles as an excuse for not loving people genuinely and to have a deep and genuine concern for others. Two, there's two are to be present then. So let's look then uh, at verse six. He's referring uh, there in, uh, he, in these verses, he's referring to verse six of that subject of loving the brethren. Uh, uh, one word uh, we know, don't we? Philadelphia. 
uh, a Philadelphia love, that familial love, a family love, a sibling love, uh, a love of mother to child, a love of child to mother. That sort of thing is to be expressed and seen in the life of a New Testament church. A love and commitment in the context of a of a family and we I trust we've experienced that in the church we we're a family we sometimes really feel that don't we and it's wonderful to experience and know a church that is a family uh, that's uh, the kind of love we are to pursue uh, and I would say as well to expect in the church You've got to be careful with that. No church is perfect, of course. Here is a, a, a body of people who are committed uh, to one another, who are faithful to one another. The kind of people you will love no matter what, who will be loyal to you and stand with you, who are looking after your best interests, who care for you. They want to build you up. They don't want to tear you down. They want to build you up. They bear burdens with you. They're glad to hear from you. They're glad to hear about the aches and pains. <laughs> they forgive you. They show kindness to you. And it's a joy to show kindness to you. Family love, then. That's what he's, he's talking about. That sort of picture we're to have in our minds love towards the brethren this philadelphia love you have no need for us to write to you we've we've been over this before he's saying and moreover than moreover he is saying you you yourselves are taught by god uh, now this experience this uh description or what the picture that we're to conjure up in our minds is not one that we can mimic from the world really then is it it's one that is taught from god himself from heaven that has come down to us uh, we can't discover it from the, the earth it must be brought down to us by the holy spirit he who illuminates uh, god's love he who uh, teaches us uh, he who uh, uh, teaches us what love actually looks like then he points us doesn't he the holy spirit he points us then to the lord jesus christ and when we look at jesus christ on the cross we look at him crucified for us we look at him giving his life so willingly in obedience to the father's will to purchase us to redeem us to give us hope to give us heaven to give us a, a right standing with with the justice of God to give us a place in the kingdom of God. Well, we, we know then, don't we, uh, the love. We know what love is when we, when we begin to explore and survey the wondrous cross of Jesus. And, and it's the Holy Spirit, I'm saying to you, who has taught us. He, he applies that, uh, that teaching to us. Uh, the, the hymn writer says, doesn't he, um, in the, the hymn, for your gift of uh, of God the Spirit. He himself, the living author, wakes to life the sacred word, reads with us its holy pages and reveals our risen Lord. He it is who works within us, teaching rebel hearts to pray. He, the mighty God, indwells us his to strengthen, help and empower. In 1 John Chapter 2, verse 27, the Apostle John says something similar. But the anointing, the anointing of the Holy Spirit, then, that you received from him abides in you. And you have no need that anyone should teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about everything and is true and is no lie, just as it has taught you, you abide in him. Well, it's so, you know, don't you, you know this evening how important it is. I'm not teaching you that. Um, how important it is to love the brethren. Uh, it's crucial, though, for us in our witness that we love in this way. 
and maybe all the more so in our present generation. The world is a very hard and cold place, isn't it? For many, many people, the people that we live next to, our neighbours and our friends, the people we work with, it's a dog-eat-dog world, largely as um, well, my, <laughs> my wife's school is experiencing at the moment with uh, a restructure taking place. Um, it's a doggy dog world in many ways, though. There are, there are people, aren't there, in the world around us who are looking for somewhere to belong and be accepted. That's, that's natural and it's, and it's healthy to desire that. It's not a bad thing. They want to be truly loved. Well, the church is to be that, that kind of place. And it can only be that kind of place if we, on the one hand, uphold the moral standards of purity and at the same time seek to love one another. Uh, it's that familial love then we are to, to expect, expect. We know, don't we, as well, that uh, it's not fundamentally because that we, it's not fundamental fundamentally that we love one another because uh, we like one another. That's not where it begins, is it? We know that. Uh, we're not to expect that either. It's, be it's not that we've come together on a, simply on a, on a common interest. And that's why we love one another. We're not a family because these people are like me. It's not that they are a people who have gone through some sort of training to get to a position where we can feel comfortable with them. No, these are Christ's people. They are disciples of his, whether they are like me or whether they are my kind of people or not, whether they are of my social status or interests or, interest or not. These are my fellow brethren, my fellow believers. They are his Christ has purchased them and he has purchased them with the same precious blood with which he purchased me. But therefore, we are to love one another. Now, that's the, the first thing, really, love one another. But secondly, I want us to, to, to go further. That's what the Apostle Paul is saying here. Go further. Go further. You excel further than, than this. Go further along in this. Go further than you have done up to this particular point in time. And God works through uh, time and experience in the life of a church, in the life of uh, believers. Verse 10, then, you are to put this into practice. You are doing this. You are doing this in all of the churches in, of Macedonia. What's going on here? The churches, these Macedonian churches were in Berea and in Philippi. And apparently they had loved Macedonian brethren when they came to Thessalonica. Thessalonica, we know, was that commercial centre. They may have extended hospitality to the believers who travelled into Thessalonica, or to the traders who were Christians, maybe. There were no premier inns and uh, travel lodges in Thessalonica, so Christians took others on and looked after them. And um, maybe the Apostle Paul here at this point um, is uh, in verse 10. He is commending that sort of sacrificial love that they were already showing. Or maybe they were supporting Christian missions in Macedonia. There were offerings taking there were offerings taken up for such works and money was sent to establish these churches and that was good aid for the church and that was good but the apostle paul is saying go on from this 
maybe I'd like to make a, an observation then uh, here at this point. Sometimes it's easier to support uh, such works, to support Christians in other countries or missionary activities than it is to love the people who are closest to us. Do you see what I'm saying? I wonder whether that's a device that the devil uses. He can get thousands of Christians at times um, uh, to focus on one particular thing to the extent that we forget that which is right in front of our faces. Uh, we can pump all of our money into one particular thing when there are actually needs at home, on home soil. Sometimes it's easier, isn't it, to love people across the way than it is to love people maybe in our own homes. He, the Apostle Paul is saying, you know what love is. You practice it there in Macedonia. Well, why not here more? What about the person sitting next to you, as it were? Um, difficult when we're in our in our living rooms, perhaps, but uh, you know what I mean. Uh, you can always count on Charles Schultz, can't you, uh, for a clever quote. Linus exclaims in the Peanuts cartoon, I love mankind, it's people I can't stand. Sometimes we can, we can be so concerned with the big picture that we forget about the individuals right in front of us. You can love people in generality. But we're here in the life of the church, even in this pandemic, and we're not going to be about that. We want to love people. That's where the difficulty is too as well. That's where the challenge is, is when these are the people that you are committed to that you're living with, that you're in the church with, as, if, as it were. Uh, we urge you, brothers, this, this covenant commitment that you've made to one another. We, we have it in church membership, don't we? Well, love more and more. Well, now, I do want to move on. There's a, there's a shift, and a, again, going a bit more practical again, in these three areas in respects to love in the verses that uh, follow, uh, verse 11 and verse 11 and 12. And all in this subject of seeking to love more, uh, love more and more. Aspects here in verse 11 and 12 that are perhaps quite surprising. Uh, they're quite different a different description of what we find in 1 Corinthians 13 or in in John 14 love one another that the world would know that we are we are then his disciples he says then one by living a quiet life two by minding your own business and three by getting back to work that's that's the application here really isn't it um well, let's let's see firstly then. Um, good aspirations, a quiet life. This might seem like a bit of a an oxymoron. Uh, make it your ambition. Make it your ambition. One translation says to have uh, to have no ambition or seek. <laughs> that's one one translation anyway. Perhaps pretty radical. Seek restlessly to be still, one commentator says. Make it your ambition to live quietly. Well, what's the problem here? What's the background to the situation? The problem was that their lives, as is, in, as is the case in the world today, uh, certainly have become characterised by, by meddling, a ceaseless activity. Public activity, moving, always moving about, going and doing to the detriment of their own souls, to their spiritual condition and development. If you want to have an ambition, the Apostle Paul is saying here, 
you want to have an ambition here it is have a quiet life <laughs> don't squander your life uh, don't squander your gifts your gifts can be easily corrupted don't allow your life to be merely a life of mindless activity that seems to be a, a description of our world very much at the moment i think we've we're coming out of lockdown aren't we and, and people are very very busy very busy and there's a lot of pressures that are coming along with that ceaseless relentlessness the busyness what are we busy doing we are um oh i was, I was just looking at, at this book uh, take care of yourself survive and thrive in the christian ministry and uh, here there he says uh, we are as i was reminded of course such a helpful reminder we're human beings aren't, aren't we after all not human doings always running ceaseless noise the tv's always on music all of the time people can't stand silence young people can't just walk to school I literally saw two my neighbor he's a young lad he lives a couple of doors down from me and um he was looking at his phone and then his friend came along. I presume they planned to walk together and they both got up, both looking at their phones. Not, not a single word spoken to each other, but they had their phones while they were both walking and they walked off to school, both like this. <laughs> that sort of relentless noise, the, the headphones on. It must be something to be entertained with all of the time. Um. Well, the problem with that is that it leads leads to no time for reflection. And it's important, isn't it, dear friends, this evening, that we find time to reflect, to stop and to be quiet. Uh, we think about heaven. We think about hell. We think about eternity. We think about God. We think about holiness. We think about the meaning of the cross. We think about our standing with God. Have you, have you ever asked a young person, have you ever looked up at the stars and just wondered? And sometimes they'll say, no, I've never done that. Never stopped to just look at the stars. It's amazing. All the noise. To be a disciple of Christ, though, we have to, we have to actually think about things. We have to think about God. Why we are doing the things we're doing it's important for us to stop and have a and be reflective be still and know that i am god be still before the lord and wait patiently for him fret not yourself over the one who prospers in his way a quiet life to so the world that's a, a waste of time isn't it but the Apostle Paul is saying, make that your ambition, that you might better then love one another. Well, secondly, mind your own business. <laughs> I think the context here is this, what we might call this parousia hysteria, an overexcitement. I, mean, I guess we want to encourage one another to be more excited about the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. We want to be praying, come Lord Jesus, Maranatha. We, we, we want to be desiring for his glory to be shed abroad. But apparently there were, there were people, and you, we know, don't we, you can overemphasize one thing and it become an unhealthy thing. Apparently there were these people who were so hyped up about the return of christ they thought that it was imminent that it was going to happen any moment and so they it seems they quit their jobs and they spent all of their time in strange activities um maybe uh they were stopping altogether then they took a good thing and they made it an unhealthy thing 
They ended up in trouble, it seems. Too much time on their hands. It can be dangerous, can't it? How many people have just had too much time on their hands in lockdown over these last 12 months and reading endless articles on the internet without actually conversing with another human being about what they actually, the application of them. It's been a concern of mine anyway, here in Pembrokeshire. I don't know about Cliddach. Uh, we know, don't we, that uh, too much time being on your hands can be the devil's, uh, the devil's handiwork, the devil's play, playground. They were idle. They weren't working, and so they became busybodies. Uh, if you turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 11, it says there, For we hear that some among you walk in idleness, not busy at work, but busy bodies, getting into other people's business, maybe pursuing public recognition uh, without a real and genuine concern for people's souls and their well-being. As a church, then we're not to, to get into other people's business. If we're invited to, then we will get into business. <laughs> and we will but we will pr proceed carefully. And when their private business becomes public business, then that's when church leaders need to get involved as well, isn't it? But we're not going to peer into other people's windows and snoop around a sort of spiritual mafia, finding out what's going on, discovering things that are not ours to discover. No, we're going to mind our own business. We're going to, well, like the, the, the book says there, as is a quotation from Acts 20, isn't it? You, take care of yourself. Take care of yourself. And from that, we can better serve uh, others and then thirdly get back to work uh, here in the, in this context work with your own hands uh, this isn't a, 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 a we have a food bank in in hill park and um so we uh, sometimes sensitive about this particular matter but it's it's not a political statement against those who who come to food banks uh, work with your own hands i think uh, sometimes that that comment is made um, no, we're, we're to think about the Greek context here, the, the menial labour work, working with one's hands was, was a, a work that was despised by the Greeks. It was what slaves and animals do is working with their own hands, getting dirty. But we believe, don't we, this evening, there is dignity in all forms of, of work. Going and cleaning the toilet collecting the bins. It is virtuous to God if we're doing it for him. Uh, going and building chairs and, and tables, well, that's the carpenter's work after all, isn't it? So how dare we look down on those things? Work, work with your own hands. Don't, don't quit your work is what the Apostle Paul was saying. And don't despise the work that God has given you to do. If the saviour were to come tomorrow, you're to, to check in at work if you have work, if you've been blessed with that. You're to check in at work at nine o'clock and carry on. Honour God by so doing. Support yourself in this way. If anyone's not willing to work, let him not eat. We know from 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. And verse 12 of chapter 4, then here is how you are to love the brethren. Don't be unnecessarily burdensome to the, to the rest so that others will have to bail you out. There are legitimate needs. Sometimes we're going to have to phone up uh, another brother or sister in the church and ask for help. We're going to have to ask for financial help maybe even from the church. The church is to seek to alleviate uh, practical concerns wherever possible as well. It's a good thing. 
but we are called to support ourselves. And the purpose of this is that we would be a good witness to those outside the church. Uh, win the respect, the New International Version says there in verse 12. If we fail to love one another by being idle, by being busybodies, then the result is that we undermine the credibility of the church. And the world is watching. The world is watching us today. We, we often feel like a non-entity, but the world is watching us. They're watching a lot, actually. And sometimes they're watching us in a long-term way before it gives us credibility. I think we need to realise that in our present generation as such distrust. And so if we can prove our love uh, for one another over a long period of time, then that does much good. Much good. As we love one another, the world will be challenged and see that we are disciples of Christ after all. And that's what we want to be, isn't it? I, I want to be a be pure and filled with selfless love. Well, the only way is if we are taught from heaven. The only way is is found in God's help. We can't muster that sort of thing from within a true and genuine love for one another. We need God's help. We need to be taught from heaven, but we need to pray as well. I'm calling upon us to, to pray that the Lord would stir us uh, to love more, uh, to love more than we have done. We're not there yet. It's not time to relax and sit back and let others do it. We're to pray. Uh, we need him to come and work within us, to pour out his spirit, pray that we would live quiet and peaceable lives that are, are walking closely with the Lord. And out of that close walk, we can care genuinely uh, for our dear brothers and sisters who we do love uh, in, in the church. Let's